Lest I start saying all the things that um, Dora is going to tell you about, suffice it to say, uh, human rights, uh, head tax issues, um, work as her most recent uh, career is working with the, um, the Ontario Human Rights uh, Society, uh, um, lawyer, uh, uh, documentary filmmaker, uh, consultant uh, to um, all these great projects on Canadian Chinese history. Uh, what, what can I say? It's, it's a really great honor for us to, to have you here, uh, Dora. Uh, I know we have undergraduates who are currently doing uh, degrees in our department, and this will be yet another opportunity for them to see that there is indeed life after a BA in Asian Studies. And so please join me in welcoming one of our very distinguished graduates, Dora Nip. Good evening. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you very much for the weather. It makes me feel right at home. We didn't bring it. Um, just put my glasses on. So um, again, good evening. I'd like to uh, welcome you all here tonight. And again, thank you very much for coming because uh, the weather uh, isn't the best, but it's really, really nice to see everybody here. I've met some new folks, and I've uh, met people who I've known for a long time and haven't seen for a long time. And of course, there's my family. So uh, thank you, UBC, for inviting me. And thank you to the Dr. Sonia Sagarzis for this beautiful venue. Um, I'm humbled and grateful for the opportunity to be able to acknowledge many people who have guided me uh, along the way. I've had many guides uh, and advisors, people who helped to shape my worldview and uh, also my character. Um, I'm a historian, a lawyer, uh, an educator, and a human rights advocate, and I come equipped with a very strong sense of identity. Um, as well as a very deep pride in my community. And UBC's Asian Studies Department provided me with a very strong foundation that has seen me through some very interesting times. And, and you know the Chinese saying, may you live in interesting times? It's a curse. I would have to say that it hasn't been a curse at all, but it has been a really wild ride. Okay. Now, I'm sure you're thinking that uh, this is a very odd title uh, for a talk. Ni hao ma, tu hao jila. Well, when uh, Professor King gave me a call, he asked me to reflect on uh, my time at UBC uh, in Asian Studies. And um, while it has been very, uh, a very important part of my life, I have to say I haven't given it a lot of thought in the last X number of years. And so um, uh, I thought back to Chinese 100. And one of the first things you learn in Chinese is ni hao or ni hao ma. So I thought, okay, that's one of the first things that I learned. And then I remember very clearly in Dr. Wall's class, he would say, hao jila. And to me, hao jila, it really is um, an, an exclamation for this incredibly wonderful, fulfilling journey um, that I've had that just keeps uh, getting better. And so that's the genesis of this talk. So I am a techno and I'm going to try to do this click here. Yay. <laughs> This is the subtitle of the talk, uh, Dora the Explorer and Friends. Now, there's some obvious uh, similarities, right? There's the name, I had it first. There's the haircut, <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, yes, I do cut my hair like hers on purpose. It's great, I'm a celebrity. So when I meet little kids, it's, hi, I'm Dora, and their eyes always pop yeah. out. <laughs> the thing is, I didn't know who Boots was. So um, when I met this little girl for the first time, she goes, where's Boots? And I was thinking, Boots must be a dog. Okay? Uh, no, for those of you who are not familiar with Dora the Explorer, Boots is her uh, sidekick, who's a little monkey. So I had to do a quick uh, cover on that. And the third similarity that we have is that we travel with a group of very colorful and uh, inspirational characters. Um, my name's uh, Dora. Uh, and my Chinese name, uh, Zhong Dian, have pretty much um, been my uh, destiny. See, my family name is Nia, or Nip in Cantonese, and it's three ears. Okay? So I do have to say I have very good hearing. My Chinese name is Zhong Dian, Zhong Din, uh, which can be translated as a keeper of the ancestral records. And uh, my name was actually given to me by Lei Zhenhong, uh, Mr. Lee. He's a gentleman on the far right. He was a Chinese school teacher. 
um, in Victoria. So with names like Dora and Zongdin, my path in life was pretty much set early on. I'm a, I was, a, well, I am, a, a, a professional student. Yeah. There's the path. My uh, interest in Chinese Canadian history and, and the Chinese diaspora has really taken me around the country uh, and around the world. I started uh, at UBC learning Mandarin and, and I studied Chinese history and political science. From there I did a pit stop at, uh, at UVic for a diploma in uh, ESL. I had a dream of going to China to teach English until a Chinese official told me that that wasn't going to happen because I have a Chinese face. So, so that's okay. So uh, one day I was reading Chinatown News and uh, some of you may remember the Chinatown News as first English language publication um, for the Chinese Canadian community that covered news on the Chinese community. So here I was flipping through Chinatown News and I saw an ad and it was for a fellowship in Chinese Canadian history and I said yes that's for me. So I applied for that and uh, I received the fellowship and there was just one tiny uh, little obstacle or little hurdle they had to overcome. I hadn't applied to U of T. So um, the what I did was I told U of T that my application was stuck in the mail and there just happened to be a national mail strike at that time. <laughs> and so again, destiny stepped in. So I said, I will send you another application. So I quickly filled out one and I curried it. Curried it, curried it. Can you cut that out please when you do the video? <laughs> to um, to uh, Toronto. While I was at U of T, I, um, and this is just a tip for the students who are here, when you're waiting between classes, always check the bulletin boards. So that's what I used to do. That's how I got through university. I checked the bulletin boards for scholarship applications and fellowship applications, so I saw another one that really interested me. And that was uh, a Commonwealth scholarship for the University of Hong Kong. And I thought, yes, I would like to go to Hong Kong U. So I filled out an application and I submitted it to study um, overseas Chinese at, at Hong Kong U. I got accepted and so I spent some time uh, at Hong Kong and I started doing uh, PhD research on the economics of trans-Pacific migration. After I spent some time in Hong Kong, I returned to Toronto and I had a short hiatus from university life and I actually got a full-time job uh, with the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Uh, I then left the commission and from there I went to the University of Windsor and I did a law degree and now I've come full circle. Uh, I've, uh, I'm in the master's program at the University of Victoria um, in dispute resolution and much to my chagrin they used, they used the same student number that I had uh, when I started at UVic. Yes. So uh, my tuition was late. I called my niece in Victoria and asked if she could write a check for me and I gave her my student number. She said, two numbers are missing. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> Now I'd like to take you back, um, if I can, to an earlier uh, place in time so that uh, you, you can see how a, a youngster from northern BC um, became so interested in Chinese Canadian history. This is Prince George. My brother, Cliff, who's here tonight, and my sister, Bonnie, we were all born in Prince George. Now, in the 1960 census, our immediate family comprised 10% of Prince George's Chinese community. Uh, the, others in my, uh, the others included my father's cousin, a uh, family of five, and several other families, as well as uh, the bachelor uncles and, and older brothers who worked for or cooked in the cafes and restaurants. My father, Philip, ran the Embassy Cafe in Prince George, and it opened on November 1st, 1952. That was the day that the Great Pacific Eastern Railway, the PGE, rolled into town. My mother, Ellen, she shopped at uh, Woolworths and Kresge's and at the Bay. And on Saturday afternoon, we went to the Strand Theatre, which is to your far right there, uh, to watch the Saturday matinees. We watched the Three Stooges. From there, we would dash across the street to my father's restaurant. Whoops. We have a technical difficulty. Sorry, I'm trying to right, left, left click it. Is it a right click? Mm 
Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. So, you see the seats on the left there? We would race all the way down to the very end, and we would sit at the first few seats there, and um, we'd do one of two things. My father would either have french fries ready for us, or we would take a look at the jello in the pastry shelf across the way. And uh, we'd take the red jello, my father would shake up the whipped cream canister, and shh, put the whipped cream on top. There's a proverb that says it takes a, a village to raise a child. And I have to say that we were very fortunate and that we had an entire village in the form of our extended family, aunts, uncles, uh, and a lot of cousins on both sides of our family. My father was born in Victoria. His father arrived in 1881 and worked on the CPR. He came from Yenping. Um, my grandmother arrived in 1891. She paid a $50 head tax. And when I was researching the RG76, and I believe that Henry Yu at, the, uh, at UBC's Department of History has actually digitized the RG76 records, which makes it very easy to search for names, I found my grandparents by manually going through reels and reels of, of microfilm, reading through each line. And on my mother's side, the, uh, her grandfather, H. Y. Lee, arrived in the 1890s uh, via San Francisco. Now, both sides of my family paid the head tax. And as a descendant of a CPR worker, I would say that we are practically Chinese-Canadian royalty. <laughs> You're going to hear me say this several times tonight. And that is, my family has had an extremely strong influence on my Chinese identity. I'll just give you some examples. My Uncle Hank sent up a paper mache uh, lion head and up to Prince George. And I took that to our show and tell class when I was in grade two. I remember putting it into my bicycle, into the little carrier, and I pedaled to elementary school. And I proudly talked about this lion head to grade twos who looked at me like I was an alien. But it, it didn't matter. Uh, and I rode home with that. And I told my mom about it. And, and I just felt very, you know, very, very proud. Um, every summer, we would come down from Prince George and visit relatives in Vancouver. We would hang out the old Panda Realty uh, on Panda Street. Uh, we would visit my mother's brothers uh, at Lake Hugh and uh, at the Marco Polo, my uncle Alex. Another thing that my father would do when we came down to Vancouver is that he would take us to Woodward's. And we would go up and down. <laughs> The escalators. And that was so much fun because there were no escalators in Prince George. So that's how he would entertain us. And I'm sure that when you remember things that, are very, that you're very fond of, um, there's a strong association between memory and food. Right? So I remember a lot about the foods that we ate when we were kids, like the hambao at the BC Royal, which used to be across the street, okay? or the apple tarts at the Hong Kong Cafe. Do you remember those apple tarts? Those are really good apple tarts. We also went down to, over, uh, to Victoria. And we would spend a lot of time just running around the streets in Victoria uh, while my parents visited with my Aunt Susie. This is a Silk Road tea shop. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Victoria. I have some relatives who are from Victoria here. This is where my Aunt Susie's store, Yik Fong, was for, for many years. My grandfather started uh, the shop in the 1890s as a dry goods store. He was a tailor and he made uh, denim clothes. And this store was in operation until the 18, uh, 1980s, sorry, when uh, Aunt Susie passed away. She was also part owner of the Embassy Cafe, which is the Victoria Embassy Cafe, on, on Fisgard Street. And like many of the little tiny restaurants and cafes in, in BC at that time, it had a incredible pastry shelf. And the pastries in there were very fine, fine pastries. The types of pastries that you would see in fine Victorian homes like Boston cream pie, lady fingers, butter tarts that would melt in your mouth. And that's because many of the bakers who prepared these pastries worked as domestic servants or had worked as domestic servants um, in some of those fine Victorian homes. My aunts and uncles taught at the Chinese school uh, in Victoria. My father grew up in different parts of Chinatown, including uh, the little the stairs to your left there. This is the entrance to Fantan Alley. My father 
lived in the apartment on the top floor, and when the police would raid that area because there was a gambling den on the second floor, my grandfather apparently would lead people up to the third floor, <coughs> cut through their apartment, and then sneak down <laughs> the other side. Our visits to Victoria always included a stop at the Tamgong Temple, which is the oldest Chinese temple in Canada. And I heard my mother talking about Tamgong Temple in Macau, so when I took the women's photo exhibit to Macau, I made a point of, of stopping in. This is at Harling Point in Victoria, and this is where my grandparents and where many of the Chinese were originally buried. You're probably getting a sense now of um, how the Chinese part of my Canadian identity uh, was taking shape. Although we lived in Prince George, we would come down to Vancouver a lot, and uh, my father was a major influence in, in, uh, in my life, and I would circled him there, he's sitting in the front row. I was reflecting back on turning points or milestones in your life, where when someone will say something or you'll have an experience that takes you in a certain direction. And there are two things that came to my mind, and I hadn't thought of them in a very long time. And that, and that was how my father would introduce us to experiences and then would allow us to make meaning of those on our own. I went to Chinatown today and I was looking for the spot where this restaurant was, and I think it was where 130 Pender Street is now. It used to be a, a restaurant. That's about, I think, four years older. So I was sitting there with my father and we were having lunch. And this very old Chinese man, an elderly man, came in and um, a gentleman had just gotten off his seat from the stool. And this elderly man just stepped into the seat and he drank what remained of the coffee that the other, per the other person had left. And my father looked over and saw what was happening. He didn't say anything. He just ordered a fresh cup of coffee and a jin doi, you know, those uh, little grease balls um, for the elderly man. But he didn't say anything to me, and I, I watched that. And I think the same summer, my cousin Leon took me over to Oppenheimer Park. Not that he took me over there, but he had parked over there. And there was a long line of, of people waiting for a soup kitchen at one of the churches. So he said, Dora, what do you see over there? I said, oh, I see people lined up. And he said, uh, what do you think they're doing? The only lineups I knew were the ones we had at the Strand Theatre where you would line up to see a movie. So I said, I think they're lining up to see a movie. And he explained to me, no, that they're there because they don't have anything to eat and so the church is going to um, provide them with lunch. But I couldn't get my head around that. And I said, well, what about their families? Don't they have families? So he explained to me that, no, not everybody has families and not everybody has money. And, and that stuck with me. Um, and I think those two points were sort of the beginning influences of why it is I got interested uh, in human rights. For my mother, she gave me pride in her family. My uncle Alex is here, and um, he was in the documentary. The Louis family sent uh, five boys to war. And as you know, the Chinese were not conscripted. Um, but Uncle Alex was part of Force 136, and my friend Larry Wong, who's over at Paul Yee's function tonight, um, explained to me that the bridge on the River Kwai was based on Unit 136, Uncle Alex's unit. And uh, they paid tribute to the Chinese unit with the, um, the badge on the shoulder. It's of the Blue Thunderbird. And the number that they have on, um, in the movie is 163. <coughs> So, um, again, I think you can have a, 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 I guess a better idea of, of how my Chinese identity is starting to take shape. So with a bit of an introduction to this background, um, I don't think it would surprise you that when we moved to Vancouver, uh, I ended up doing a lot of babysitting for cousins to save up for tuition. And I also worked in a Chinese restaurant. I was a dim sum girl in high school. And that came up in conversation at work one day. And one of my officers was listening to the story. And he said, you know what? There's a lesson to be learned from this. Yeah? He said, uh, always be nice to the dim sum girl, because she could be your manager one day. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so through working in the restaurant uh, and through babysitting, I uh, ended up at UBC, Asian Studies. Now, why did I study Asian Studies? I was obsessed with things that were Chinese. And, and you can see that history was literally uh, in my blood. What I really, really wanted to study was Chinese Canadian history. But there weren't courses in that area per se at UBC, so I'd approach it this way. I said, well, I'll study about the, the Chinese before they came over then. So I'll learn about the history in China and then figure out how they came across the Pacific. So I'll save that, that um, part for later. And uh, in the meantime, I would learn Chinese so I'd be able to read the Chinese newspapers. So my home for quite a few years was Buchanan Building. You have a palatial place now. Uh, in Buchanan Building, we had a, a little room, and it was the Asian Studies Reading Room. But it was a haven at that time for me. You know where the Buchanan Building is? I don't know if it's still around or not. It's like the farthest point from B lot. Right? My brother and I used to drive out, and we always parked at B lot. So when it rained, by the time you got to Buchanan, your pants would be soaked up to your knees. It'd be like wading in a river all the way down. So the Asian Studies Reading Room not only provided me with a place to study, um, a place where I could you know, boil water and make instant noodles, it also allowed me to dry my shoes on the heater. And, and that was really important because uh, you don't want to sit studying for you know, eight to ten hours uh, in wet shoes. Oops. Professors who inspired me. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find the photographs of a number of, of my professors, but I, I would like to uh, talk to you about them. Jan Walls is my Chinese 100 and 101 uh, professor. And I have to say thanks to my three ears when Professor Walls did the quizzes on the tones. I don't know if, st if you had that. I was always up there putting my hands up because I always got the tones right. <laughs> professor Huters was my uh, second year Chinese professor. Jerry Schmidt was my third year professor. Jerry Schmidt's not here tonight, so I can talk about him. <laughs> I told you earlier that I also I babysat to save up for tuition for UBC. Well, I was Professor, professor Schmidt's babysitter. And um, when I, uh, the first time I babysat his daughter, he was going to pay me far more than the going rate at that time. And so I said, no, 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 that's, that's way too much. He goes, no. I'm going to pay you $1.25 an hour because you're an undergrad. And when you go to grad school, it's going to be $1.50 an hour. <laughs> I also don't have a photograph here of Don Sun, Sun Tai Tai. Sun Tai Tai was our lab professor, our lab instructor, yes. And we spent many lunch hours having lunch with her. And uh, to this day, when um, uh, I think about the flashcards. You know how you have to do flashcards to study Chinese? I have hundreds of boxes of flashcards. I still hear Sun Tai Tai's voice in my head. Edgar Wickberg was my history professor. And um, if you can believe this, when I applied for grad school at UVic uh, recently, uh, th and this is before Professor Wick, obviously before Professor Wickberg passed away. I applied about four, three, four years ago. Um, I had to get letters of reference. I called Professor Wickberg because we'd kept in touch all these years, and I asked him if he could write a letter for me to go to UVic. So just think about that. You're writing a letter for a student who was in your class 25 years ago. Okay? And he said, sure. Didn't think anything of it. And at the same time, it didn't occur to me not to ask him. So as I say, Professor Wickberg and I kept in touch uh, all this time. And uh, we had some great talks about Chinese-Canadian history. And from uh, Professor Chamberlain, I learned about the machinations of the Chinese Communist Party, which would serve me very well in the decade following the June 4th massacre. So yes, at UBC, I was uh, very much obsessed with things Chinese, and um, I was a very good comrade. We studied Chinese using a lot of the uh, rhetoric at that time, you know, but I also played the part. I wore a blue minap, which is the Chinese padded coat, 
and uh, it's very Chinese, and that's what I wore for like four years, three or four years in UBC. When I became interested in, in the community's history, um, it was my family who supported that interest. This is my uncle Fred Yi. My father, my aunts, and my uncles gave very generously of their time to tell me their stories, and I literally sat at their, uh, their feet with a tape recorder, asking them questions. What was it like in Victoria? Uh, what was it like being Chinese during the Exclusion Act? What was it like in high school? Do you remember your grandmother? Right? And I heard the most amazing stories. I heard about how my grandfather worked on the CPR, and after that, he strung telephone lines uh, up island. I heard about how the Chinese community raised millions of dollars during the Second World War for the, the war efforts. I uh, heard about uh, how my father used to have to beat up Porky Anderson every day after school so that he wouldn't pick on the Chinese kids. Or during, how, during Halloween, all the uh, kwai kwai zai, the uh, hooligan, uh, would come down to Chinatown to break, up the, to break the windows and smash up the businesses. And how my father, when he turned 15 or 16, that year, all the boys waited for them to come down Halloween. And then after that year, none of those kids came back. I also heard how my father's basketball team, 1932, 33, 33, 34, island champions, that when they came home after every successful basketball game, the Chinese community lined up in the street and cheered for them when they came home. So how did they know? My dad said that, well, this is how we would do it. So let's say the score was, well, we won. It was 76 to 68. Okay? We pick up the phone and we place a collect call. You would say, operator, I'd like to place a call to Mr. Chut Sup Look. Okay? <laughs> yes, my name is Mr. Look Sup Bot. <laughs> oh? No one's there? Thank you, we'll try again. <laughs> so that's what I mean. okay. My father also took me to see the Chinese immigration house before it was torn down, so I remember seeing it like that. And this is where Uncle Fred stayed as a young boy uh, until, he was, until his father came to pick him up. And Uncle Fred's father ran a little laundry and then a, a saloon in, of all places, Troshu. Alberta. When I was living uh, in Victoria, doing my uh, certificate in ESL, I came across a number of photographs in my Aunt Susie's cellar. And if you've seen my documentary, it opens up with actually a trunk, but it really was an apple box, a wooden apple box full, filled with photographs. And from those photographs, I saw pictures of people whose names I had heard. And I saw a completely different life from what little I knew of the community's experience. So I learned about uh, community events. I learned about fundraising. I looked about, learned about picnics. And this is a photograph of the Chinese Women's Auxiliary raising funds for the war effort. This is my Aunt Gladys at a variety show. Chinese school picnic. Now, if you look closely at this photograph, it looks like any sports day event, except for the fact that there are older people there. And there weren't a lot of children at that time. I learned how my Aunt Mabel's class was segregated. So there's a picture on the left of the Chinese public school. And I also learned that the Chinese parents boycotted the public school when the children were segregated. And what they did was that they fundraised and they came up with $6,000 so that the children could be taught the same school curriculum but in the Chinese school. They had hired a lawyer to fight the Board of Education and he was so appalled by what had happened, he charged the parents $1 for a retainer. So then the money went to hiring teachers, books, and so that's where the uh, Chinese uh, the Chinese students were actually taught the public school curriculum for two years. After Victoria, I went to uh, Toronto, so East to Toronto. So I had a fellowship in hand, but again, I wasn't, hadn't been accepted uh, into U of T. But that was okay. We'd, we'd figure um, out what, uh, what we would do. I stayed with my friend who was looking after another history professor's house. 
And this shows you how small the world is. When I was there, Professor Anthony Chan called Professor Jerome Chen's house. And my friend Philip, who was in my class at UVC, picked up the phone. He said, by the way, there's a student here who's studying Chinese Canadian history. Do you want to talk to her? So I had a very quick chat with him. And he put me in touch with all these different people in Toronto, including those with the Asian Canadian Resource Workshop. And it was a group of uh, young people who started the Asian Canadian Magazine, which is a, a classic magazine. Tony Chan wrote several books on the history of Chinese and Canada, including Gold Mountain. And does anybody recognize the one on, on his left? It's Anna Mae Wong. And he wrote a biography of Anna Mae Wong called, entitled Perpetually Cool. And I was able to contribute my own autographed photo of Anna Mae Wong, which I found in a second-hand store on Queen Street in Toronto, to his publication. While in Toronto, I also met some other people who were very interested in Chinese-Canadian history. Valerie Ma, who's holding the, in the blue, and, and her husband, uh, Daniel. Valerie's family is also a, a low IQ family, as is Daniel's. Daniel's father was the first Chinese Presbyterian minister in Toronto. And Valerie did undergraduate papers on the Bachelor Society uh, in Toronto. They pretty much uh, adopted me while I was there and, and became my Toronto family. And um, after law school, I lived in a flat in their home, and they were so much like family that I lived there for 15 years. <laughs> in Toronto, I also met Doc Yip. Doc Yip was instrumental in repealing the Exclusion Act. He and his law school friend, Irving Himmel, spearheaded that initiative. And I'll tell you how I met Doc Yip. When I was articling, I had to do a lot of real estate work, so I was at the registry office registering documents for a closing. And they had chairs set up just like this. Except on that day, all the chairs were empty. And then there was Doc Yip, who was sitting right there. So when I got there, I could not possibly sit anywhere else. You'd have to sit next to the person who was already there. So I sat next to Doc Yip, and I looked at him. And he was in his 80s at the time, but he was still doing real estate closings. So I said, Mr. Yip, you don't know me, but I know who you are. So he looked at me and he said, Ah, oh, nay, so you like a. Who are you? And so I said, My name is Dora. And people in Victoria knew my family, my father's family. So I said, My name is Dora Nip. You may know my father, Philip. So he goes, Gladys, Mabel, Susie, I know your aunts, is what he said. Actually, his wife knew my aunt, knew all of my aunts. I also met Jean Lum. Jean Lum is the first recipient, first recipient of Chinese heritage to receive the Order of Canada. She was also instrumental in repealing the Family Exclusion Act and also in the Save the Chinatown campaign uh, in Toronto. And I met Jean Lum when Professor Harney sent me out to interview her on Chinese dramatic societies. A few years, well actually more than a few years ago, 15 years ago, um, a nurse, Chinese nurse that I knew who had a human rights complaint was successful in her complaint and she wanted to set up a scholarship for Chinese students. So she asked me to approach Jean Lum and I did that and from there the Jean Lum Foundation which provides uh, five to ten scholarships a year for Chinese uh, students uh, was established and now it's in its 13th year. Jean Lum Foundation. Toronto and the arts. Toronto introduced me to a world of Asian Canadian literature uh, and arts, and a number of people who influenced me. Terry Watada, who self produced seven albums. I always turn to Terry when I don't know why it is I'm doing what I'm doing for the community, because Terry's lyrics will always tell me. I think you know Paul Yi, he's the son of Vancouver. I've known Paul since I was a teenager, and I've known Paul longer than anyone else in, in Toronto. The Asian Canadian Ag Magazine introduced me to other Asian Canadian uh, writers and filmmakers, Judy Fong Bates, Sky Lee, uh, Richard Fung. And the circle of those who study Chinese Canadian history is, is actually very, very small. 
Wei Sun Choi, uh, Jim Wong Chu, and my buddy Larry Wong, who is always so generous in, in sharing his materials. Jim Wong Chu recently gave me an incredible gift, and I, I just received it the other day. He made a copy for me of the first um, Chinese English language text that the early pioneers used to learn English. D does that make sense? Okay. It, was a, a, it was like a dictionary um, phrase book that either the miners or the railroad workers brought over. Chuck Kwan, who was one of the founders of the Asian Indian magazine, he's also the um, producer of Chinese restaurants, which I think many of you are, are familiar with. And you'll see that Chuck is who I refer to as one of the usual suspects, and I'll explain that later on. Destiny stepped in uh, when I was in Toronto because I found another home that was like a fancier version of the Asian Studies Reading Room at Buchanan. And that was the multi with the Multicultural History Society, which was founded in 1976 by Robert Harney. The Multicultural History Society is an independent, not-for-profit body that was created to encourage multicultural learning. Now, the society provided me with the foundation opportunities to nurture and pursue interest in the community. And thanks to Professor Harney, I became very, a very skilled researcher. He sent me on um, virtually impossible tasks, and he expected them to be accomplished. I'll give an example. He had me review. Uh, volumes and volumes of uh, Italian immigration materials, and he told me specifically what he was looking for. He asked me to just to make photocopies, and, and he'll review them um, afterwards. I reminded him that I don't know a word of Italian, and he said, not to worry, you'll figure it out. And so that's what I did. I just looked for certain words and became a photocopy queen. <laughs> I arrived in Toronto in 1981. Professor Harney passed away in 1989. I joined the board of the Multicultural History Society in 1992, and I became CEO in 1997. The MHSO uh, ha produces photo exhibits as well as publications. We have about 70 titles. We also have over 9,000 hours of oral testimonies collected over the last 40 years, representing 60 different ethnocultural, ethno-racial groups. And we've also collected over 80,000 photographs, which are currently on deposit at the Archives of Ontario. I was the first recipient of the Chinese Canadian History Fellowship, so I was all charged up to study Chinese Canadian history here, only to find out that there weren't any courses in Chinese Canadian history. And my fellow students, Lillian studied Macedonians, John Zuki in the middle, Italians, Paula Draper, Jewish community, Jung Gun Kim to the far right, uh, Koreans. There weren't courses on any of these ethnocultural groups at all. So what we did was we became students of ethnic and immigration studies. So Professor Harney literally stuck a tape recorder um, under our arms and sent us into the community. What Professor Harney taught me to do was, he not just taught me how to conduct interviews, but he also taught me to read between the lines, to look for information that's not there, to look at materials that others don't look at. So look at non-traditional sources, Chinese language sources, for example. Don't just stick with the newspapers, government documents. He also told me to learn from the people who lived and made history. I did my master's thesis on the... Um, on pioneer Chinese women in Western Canada, interviewed my aunts and their friends. And that spun off into many uh, different directions, including the But Women Did Come exhibit. And we collected 500 photographs from across the country um, from family albums. So I'm just going to run you through some of them. It's but Women Did Come. These are some of the, the photographs that came from family albums on the, uh, your left is Toy from Kettle Creek, Amoy Bird to your right. Her husband was Sherman Bird. Their son designed the Bank of Montreal building in Toronto, which is now where the Hockey Hall of Fame was. Mrs. Louis to the left is from Kamloops. Baby Haven was born in Saskatchewan. Whoops, you're stuck again. Oh, 
here we go, sorry. Mrs. Ha Shi from uh, Montreal to the left. Mrs. Young, also from Montreal to the right. And there's a story about these women. Both women gave birth to boys very close together. And both boys were named George. So no one knows who the first baby boy born in Montreal was. It's either Mrs. Young's son or Mrs. Hashi's son. Oops. Oh, OK. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> No, no, wait, wait, it's gone backwards. Here, hang on. Start yeah. Sure. Which one are we on here? Can you see over there? Yeah. If you go, Is keep on going. One? No, next. Next. Uh, uh, that's good, that's good. Yeah. Okay, you want to click over that right here? Right? I can't see that. Okay, I'll come back. Okay. Now, um, these are some of the publications we've done on, on Chinese community or Chinese women, polyphony. Uh, Jin Guo Voices of Chinese Canadian Women uh, Coming to Gumsan. This, I wrote the story for the, um, uh, the child protagonist in Coming to Gumsan, and I merged the history of my father's family with the history of my mother's family and created a fictional story. Now, when I started studying Chinese Canadian history and focusing on women, um, Professor Harney believed that there was information out there. Not everybody shared that belief. In fact, when I was doing research, one professor told me that if he was my advisor, he would tell me to change my topic because I would never find anything on Chinese women. At that time, I was uh, much younger and I was uh, much more demure and polite. And I sat there and I listened to him and I thanked him and I just went on my way. <laughs> From uh, collecting the photographs to collecting oral histories, we then decided to use technology to help us reach a wider audience. So 15 years ago, we started introducing multimedia elements to make history come alive by using the voices of people who actually came from different uh, time periods and photographs. And so one of our first projects was the Global Gathering Place. If we fast forward to the present, the Multicultural Canada Project is a joint project with UBC, SFU, the University of Calgary, and it's a huge repository on primary materials dealing with ethnicity and immigration. And what we have on here is not only our, our newspaper collection, I, I know you don't, you're not going to get excited about newspapers, but I get very excited about newspapers. We have an incredible ethnic newspaper collection, and we microfilmed all of those. So they're available for researchers to access, and they can actually search those materials. We also have online our Encyclopedia of Canada's Peoples. So you can search by different uh, ethno-racial groups. And now we uh, are taking you to the, our Oral History Museum. Our Oral History Museum is our, it's not our most recent, but it's, we started working on it about, uh, eight years ago, we wanted to create a museum without walls, using voices and photographs. And it covers um, community building, social justice, living traditions. And it was for the Oral History Museum that we received the Rolex Award for Enterprise, specifically for heritage preservation. Check out the hair. Okay, I was the figurehead <laughs> in this one. <laughs> And uh, I received the award on behalf of the Multicultural History Society. <laughs> That's Senator Vivian Poy in the middle, and Mr. Royce, who's head of uh, Rolex Canada. Sorry, I'm just trying to get this. But this is the team. This is the team that worked on, that created the Oral History Museum. The fellow who's got the circle around his head, that's Winston Louis. He designed the imagination stations. He came up with the software. I helped with, with developing the content. Now, uh, Winston is, is a volunteer, as we all are at the Multicultural History Society. And um, Winston has an interesting story. And, and the Louis here can appreciate that. I didn't know Winston's last name, so I was writing his name in our book. I said, what's your last name, Winston? He said, Louis. I go, oh, Louis. Are you a Toy San Louis or a Jung San Louis? And he goes, oh, my family's from Jungsan. I said, oh, yeah, okay, where in Jungsan? And he said, oh, just outside Xiaque. I'm going, really? Because that's where my mom's family's from. And he said, oh, we have a, a family tree. And I'll get my dad to have a look at it, okay? So I said, we've got one, too. 
family tree, I bring my family tree. It's the same family tree. <laughs> so his father marked off where his family came from with the blue highlighter. Okay? And then one of my cousins was there. I, I had her take the book back to Uncle Alex. And Uncle Alex had marked off where our family branched off in orange highlighter. Okay? So then we counted back. Okay? Winston and the Louis, we are related 17 generations ago. His family went down to Trinidad. And the thing is, I should have known because the Louis boys have trademark hair. It's very, right, very wiry hair. And Winston's hair is just like that. So when my cousins, Guy and Calvin, came out to Toronto, I told them about Winston and I said, we're related 17 generations ago, right? And they said, we've got to meet him. So we went out to a restaurant, and I was with Guy and Calvin, and then Winston walked in, right? They looked at the hair, and Guy and Calvin looked at each other and said, the hair. <laughs> My brother has the same hair. From the Oral History Museum, I also worked on a documentary uh, with the National Film Board. And uh, the, the documentary is based on photographs from my Aunt Susie's cellar. So I interviewed um, my Aunt Gladys, my Biku, the youngest aunt, my Aunt Mabel, my Samku, my number three aunt. This is the, my Kung Fu Club who came to celebrate the launching of the National Film Board documentary. Okay. And now I want to talk to you about um, another part of my life that Toronto helped to shape, and that's uh, community activism. Actually, it was a turning point for me, and uh, it allowed me to hone my advocacy skills, and I became emerged in social change, uh, morphed into a grassroots human rights advocate. Now, at UBC, I was already involved in the W5 movement, but when I moved to Toronto, I actually fell in with the group who led that protest. So it was Dr. Joseph Wong, Eugene Yao, Winnie Ng, and a host of others. And it was Dr. Joseph Wong who founded the Chinese Canadian National Council. Now I'm gonna, whoops. Sorry. All you need to do is, I think you should stand there and stomp your feet, okay? W5. And there was a protest, as many of you know, across the country. Another um, issue that I became involved in was uh, June 4th. On June 4th, uh, 1989, you, you may not know this, but there was a demonstration in Toronto, and it was the largest demonstration outside Hong Kong. 35,000 people um, showed up in Chinatown. There was no organizing. All we did that day was, um, I drive a pickup truck. I have a little white pickup truck. And we had people in the back of the truck with a megaphone, and we were just recording the number of deaths that we were being informed of through BBC and the Red Cross. So we're going through Chinatown saying, X number have died, X number. We did that for about 45 minutes, an hour, and said, anyone who's concerned can come to Grange Park. Well, by the time we got to Grange Park, there were 35,000 people at Grange Park. Not just Chinese people, but these are people from throughout the city every walk of life. I marched with a little Japanese grandmother who was wearing wooden shoes and right next to her was this guy who had spikes in his hair, um, um, piercings and, and tattoos. And we all marched silently uh, up to the consulate. My uh, pickup truck is named Lil, named after uh, Shanghai Express and Anna Mae Wong. And Anna Mae Wong was in Shanghai Express. So here I was, um, I wasn't driving Lil, I was in the back seat of Lil. And this is a story that my friend who's a police officer told. He, all the Chinese officers, and there weren't very many in Toronto, were called to the consulate because they said there was an emergency. And for as far as the eye could see, there was a sea of people right across the street, like in a giant undulating wave heading up to the consulate. And according to my friend, um, I was in the pickup truck, and I was egging everybody on as though we were storming the Bastille. Uh, this officer um, didn't arrest me, because, and that's a very good thing, because about 15 years after that, I, I hired him as one of my mediators. <laughs> so every year, we've been commemorating the anniversary of, of the, the June 4th massacre. 
20th anniversary, we had a die-in at, at City Hall. We don't just hold protests, though. For uh, many years, I spent my vacations at the United Nations in Geneva, lobbying on behalf of political prisoners, preparing interventions, um, uh, working with representatives from Hong Kong, Europe, uh, Canada, as well as the United States, to ensure that what happened on June 4th stayed on the agenda of the international community. Head tax. I was involved in head tax in, uh, since 1987. And uh, I provide a lot of the historical research behind the scenes uh, efforts. Yeah. So we were in Ottawa uh, doing the apology. James Pond was one of the last surviving, uh, one of the, the few surviving head taxpayers. Uh, he arrived in 1923 when he was a, a baby. And this is the photograph of the Prime Minister handing him the last spike. And I'm sure you remember the, there's a recent controversy over the last spike. Nobody knew where it was. Yeah. It was actually in the Prime Minister's office and only the Prime Minister knew it was there. People who are involved in all these issues over the last 30 years, I want to pay tribute to them. The boat people, W5, uh, birth of the Chinese Canadian National Council, head tax, educating the media, police relations, politics, Project Orphan, uh, one of the first initiatives on human trafficking. The Asian Fishers issue, you may be familiar with. Asian Indian Magazine, June 4th. These are the people who are behind that. And there, there, there are a few more, but it really has been the same group of people the last 30 years. So what's, uh, what are some of the next projects that we're working on? Uh, McLean's yeah. to Asian. <clears throat> and that's only as of November the 15th. Yeah. We're working on a website on Chinese Canadian women and uh, proud parents of the person who's working on this, Julia, uh, are here. It's a website. It's going to be an educational website. There uh, will be four exhibits, a collections database, two adventure activities, educational resources, and I'm going to give you a sneak preview of this exhibit. No one has seen it yet. Okay. Fifteen years ago, when we were thinking about making Chinese Canadian history more accessible to young people, one of the dreams that I had was to create a 3D uh, um, a set of 3D illustrations of Chinatown. I actually had Fantan Alley in mind. I wanted to be able to zoom into parts of Fantan Alley, blow them up, and make those um, aspects come alive, like the Chinese restaurants, the gambling houses that were there, um, the noises and the sounds of, of Chinatown. We're now able to do that. Alistair Lee is uh, an artist in, in Toronto. This is a composite of, of Chinatown. What we're going to be able to do is actually be able to zoom in to different parts of Chinatown and then take the um, viewer right into various rooms. Another part of the women's project is um, a game. There's a vignette. So they'll be able to um, uh, take, for example, this is an opera vignette, take opera clothes and put it on this person and then take her through uh, different uh, stages of the opera, and the, the uh, illustrator is Paul Best. Ties That Bind. We just finished this project, we're working on the video of it now, and it's on the descendants of the CPR workers. Um, CPR recently celebrated the uh, completion of the CPR, 125th anniversary. No descendants or Chinese descendants were invited to that. And yet here we have generations of them. And one of them, is Brian Joe, uh, who was one of the interviewees, is here tonight. Oops. OK. I'm almost done. <laughs> now you're, yeah, that's
That's okay. Um, you're probably wondering that uh, everything that I told you about is what I've been doing uh, in a voluntary capacity. But uh, I, I do have a, a day job. And that's with the Ontario Human Rights Commission. I have been so fortunate to be able to be um, uh, to be able to pursue my interests and also to be able to get paid to do what I love to do. I have one of my colleagues from the Human Rights Commission uh, with me here tonight. I'm currently a human rights education specialist, and this is a position that has required me to use virtually every single skill set that UBC equipped me with all through my graduate program, law, etc. So I'm working on e-learning. I'm teaching people about human rights uh, using technology. I'm just going to bring this uh, to a conclusion now. Uh, what I want to say is that at UBC, I really had the good fortune to fall into a field uh, that I loved. I was equally fortunate to have professors who shared that passion and who also encouraged me. I have uh, a family, that extended family and immediate family, who are so incredibly supportive. Um, my parents never pushed me into studying sciences, and thank goodness they never did, because I do not have that Asian math gene. <laughs> I could only study you know, the arts. And I want to share this last story with you. On the day that I graduated from UBC, um, there were 11 of us who graduated, but not all of uh, my classmates were at the graduation ceremony. CTV was there, and I don't, you know, every year CTV does a story about students who graduate, and they'll pan the graduating class. They panned our entire Asian Studies class, and then they talked about the high unemployment rate and where are these students ever going to get a job. <laughs> okay. so, what worked for me um, was that I followed my heart. I did worry about a job, and I almost made a detour into commerce, but I just couldn't do it. I, I wanted to study what I really wanted to study, and um, I would say that everything has, has, has paid off. I've never had to, to look back. Um, UBC taught me a lot of things. Um, I learned to follow my heart. I learned not to shy away from challenges, and I learned to always check the bulletin boards. I also learned that uh, there will always, always be people who are, are willing to support you and to help you along the way. That there are always friends, professors, your family. Uh, there will be people to humor you and also to cheer you on. And um, I am very grateful that my parents always let me do and be uh, what I wanted. Whoops. This is the very last slide. Second last slide. Don't go away after this one. Okay, just stay there. And uh, yes, so my parents always let me be and do what I wanted, even if I was Hamburglar, and that's me to the far right. <laughs> and uh, I was early bird for uh, New Year's Eve with my cousin Richard. And um, this is when I was uh, moonlighting. So, my last slide, this is me as a line dancer. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you very much for supporting Asian Studies, as Professor King said. I'm so relieved that the Asian Studies Department at uh, the University of Toronto is not going to be closing down. And um, I thank you very much for supporting the Asian Studies program. very, very much, and uh, especially for pitching the message of resisting the lure of commerce. <laughs> uh, that's good. Um, so we, we have, uh, there is more food and, and, and tea, and tea uh, but we do have time for, for questions. I'm sure there must be questions after such a really fast-paced and informative and fascinating presentation. So who would like to ask the first question? I shouldn't have maybe made it so dramatic. Would anybody like to ask? <laughs>
thank you. That, that's a really good question. Did everybody hear that question? It's um, as putting together the, the presentation and the photographs and what I was going to say, how did I feel about doing this? You know, I, I have to say, I have not been given the opportunity until now to really reflect back on um, all the opportunities and, and people who helped me along the way. And there were many, many others. You know, tonight is, is uh, I'm getting a little bit emotional because it's giving me the opportunity to actually publicly thank people for giving me a hand. It's like you're this little lump of, of, of clay and you're walking down this path and all these people are, are, are touching you and, and shaping the direction you know, that you're going to. It was, um, it was, it was very, uh, I don't know how to say this, it was, it was, very, was very emotional and uh, it gave me a lot of pause. It, it really did. Time has gone by really fast, you know, it's like 30 years, and, uh, but it seems like yesterday, it, it really does, when I, when I think about the professors, I think about the program, I think about um, it, the protests we were involved in, all the issues that we, we fought for, um, it, it, it's, uh, it's, everything has happened very quickly, yeah, I, I'm, I'm tired now. <laughs> Yes, we went back actually a couple of times. My, um, I went back with my mother and my, my uncle Hank. Went back to the village. I think Bonnie Clifford went back twice to the village. Yes, we've seen my great grandfather's house that was there. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to get. The, the federal government has provided uh, a fund for um, the recognition program, so there are a number of projects that are going on right now to recover and recapture the, the history related to head tax. Ties that bind is on the descendants of the CPR workers who um, lived through various head taxes and the Exclusion Act. There's a video that's being put together uh, to go with Ties That Bind. But there are also a number of other projects. I know UBC has been involved in um, some huge projects um, uh, that's being funded by the head tax money and several smaller organizations in BC, Alberta, Ontario, and, and perhaps out on the East Coast. So the educational materials are being generated, a lot of educational materials. And once those materials are available online, it would just be it's fabulous opportunity for teachers to access that information, Chinese schools to be using that information as well, and also to have that material available to researchers. Other questions? We'll have time, time for a couple more. You know, there are different ways of immigration. So what I studied was, was the earlier um, immigrants up until, say, the, the late 50s, early 60s. And from that time, we've seen immigration from Chinese coming from India, South America, South Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, and the West Indies, you know, for example. And those are, to me, that's all a continuation of that immigration process. It may be a different generation. It's really important for the newcomers as well as the Canadian born to understand the history of those who came before. That's one of the reasons why um, we at the Multicultural History Society do the type of work that we do. When I teach courses in um, Chinese Canadian history to kids, I always say, how many of you have grand great grandparents who are born here? Okay. No hands. How about grandparents? No, usually no hands. Parents? One or two. 
Um, were you born here? How many of you were born here? Most of them would say, you know, we're, we're not born here. But I say to them, it doesn't matter if you were born here or not, or when you came. You inherit the legacy of those who came before you. So it's really important for you to understand why you, know, you have what you have today. You have to understand the sacrifices that people made in order for you to be able to enjoy going to whatever university you want, to be able to live wherever you want, to be able to study what you want, to be able to be what you want. All those were hard fought by. These are the photographs, these are the voices, and these are the people who made that happen for you.